Well, hello there, Section 14. How are you doing? Um, I hope you're well, uh, quite unlike me. Uh, although I have uh, turned the corner on a cold that's just been making, a terrible cold that's just been making this week um, a, a very difficult one. And I'm sneaking you a vid today. Um, I got my window open here so you can maybe hear a little rain and some bird song if we're lucky. My house is a little bit overheated today. Um, and I hope, again, I just, I hope you're well. My poet's flight got delayed um, by half an hour, so I, can, I think I can get this to you. He'll be here about 7.30, it's 10 to five now. And um, here we go, a couple, a quick explanation. You know, my little, I always have a little thing so you can know what the video's about when you start it. And I, 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 I'm pranking you a little bit. Um, I, I called it Jeff's, son of Jeff's COVID corner. Because last fall when I was trying to teach online with COVID, I called a video of that and it got a ton of views. And I, I, my video that I made for you earlier this spring that had some Philomena conk in it, that, that's got like 12,000 views. Well, I don't have COVID, I just have a cold. And um, there's no Philomena conk today, we don't have time for her. And I, I also, I don't have any free puppies. That's a pants on fire lie. So. Um, but that's the last time I'll lie to you, or lie to anyone. That's it. That's the end of my lying. Um, I'll get this going. I've got uh, some things that I want to tell you today to get you ready for the William Faulkner story, um, Barn Burning. It's the second to the last thing I'm going to put before you this year. We are running out of time. Uh, like the stage manor, manager says, you'll see him in a minute in Thornton Wilder's Our Town, which you just have to watch. Um, days running down like a tired clock. Um, We'll get going today with a poem, courtesy of Matthew Fort, kind of indirectly. Um, we had a little fun with the English department today. We, uh, Matthew, oh, excuse me, Adam Marcotte put out a call for poetry. He's like, okay, what poems should we have read at our spring celebration next well, Wednesday for honors? I'm on the honors faculty, and my first choice was, um, let's, let's, do, let's read my favorite poem of the pandemic, What You Missed That Day You Were Absent From Fourth Grade. And everybody was, thought that was a great idea. And then Ryan Deblock chimes in and he, he started up his own limerick. It's not very good. I'll read the first two lines to you. He didn't finish it. This is Deblock. He's so funny. These people are so, my department is so brilliant and so hilarious. You guys got to take more English classes. Here's Deblock. There once was a bog lord named Johnson whose waters were west of Wisconsin. Dot, dot, dot. He, again, he didn't finish it. But I like uh, Fort's choice. He chose um, Billy Collins' poem, Today. And that's going to be our poem for today. Billy Collins, Today. If there ever was a spring day so perfect, so uplifted by a warm, intermittent breeze, that it made you want to throw open all the windows in the house and unlatch the door to the canary's cage, Indeed, rip the little door from its jam. A day when the cool brick paths and the garden bursting with peonies seemed so etched in sunlight that you felt like taking a hammer to the glass paperweight on the living room end table, releasing the inhabitants from their snow-covered cottage so they could walk out holding hands and squinting into this larger dome of blue and white. Well. Today is just that kind of day. I uh, hope you uh, check out the D2L invitation for extra credit. I know one of you, Brianna, you're so smart. Um, she's, uh, she's riding uh, sh shotgun with uh, Greg Gentry, who's heading over to Pillager tomorrow. Uh, if you're near, near Pillager, um, come in, be my guest at 9 o'clock. Tell him Jeff Johnson sent you. Um, he's reading at Pillager at 9 o'clock, and then he's going to read at, at, at CLC at uh, noon. And uh, I'm so looking forward to introducing him in, in, in both venues uh, tomorrow. Um, William Faulkner is a Southerner, okay? And he's, he's also a complicated guy. And um, he's got some themes that are, I think, wonderful. And he's also got some uh, concerns and some ideas um, that are... Um, uh, I would I would call problematic and I just want you to understand enough about uh, him to be able to somewhat appreciate uh, his masterpiece of a story um, barn burning 
And the first thing we have to confront is the idea that you're going to see the N-word in that story. Okay? It's just there. Uh, the N-word that I won't breathe today um, is the most contentious, most controversial word in the entire English language. It's been tearing this country apart for uh, a couple of centuries at the least. And um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, nor will I justify it, nor will I cancel it. Okay? I'm not going to cancel a great work of art because of that. We've got something. It's. It's. I don't. I'm not an expert on this, but um, uh, there, there. There are a couple remarks to be made. Now, the N word um, was uh, famously used by Mark Twain in Huckleberry Finn 245 times, roughly. Um, I've seen different counts on it. 242, 245. It's there. It's sprinkled on it like salt. But to make the distinction and speak of these two in conjunction, um, when Mark Twain was using that word. He was using it satirically, ironically. He knew that that word was in bad taste and he's pushing our buttons, okay? He's, 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 he's pushing our buttons. There's no other way to put it. Mark, Twain was a, uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn was a book against racism. Twain was always fighting racism. As a young man, he got fired from the San Francisco Chronicle because he wrote an excoriating uh, piece of journalism uh, which lamented the treatment of uh, Chinese workers on the American Railroad. He got fired from that job. He lost every friend he had. Um, it, it cost him. He, with a dime in his pocket in a San Francisco hotel, he actually put a gun to his head uh, at the end of that dark phase of his life. He nearly, nearly pulled the trigger and he put the gun down, thank goodness. He later said that I wasn't, I'll never be ashamed for at least thinking about it. Um, but he did. He put, he put that gun down. And that book, is, there's no other way to see it. Huckleberry Finn is a book against racism. Um, and we, we see that in the dignity and the humanity of Jim. Faulkner is more complicated. He was a southerner. He was using the word the way southerners used it, whether he spoke it or whether uh, he wrote it. And I think... <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ill. I'm trying to cover up my lab mic. Um, the most important thing I can probably tell you about Faulkner is at least he had an evolution of thought. By the end of his life, Yes, he was probably racist when he was a young man, but at the end of his life, he was a champion of civil rights. Uh, so thoroughly uh, so that uh, the United States State, State Department, they made him an, like an ambassador, and they sent him around the world, starting with a flight to Japan, to push for civil rights around the world. And um, he wasn't very good at that because he was drinking so much, but um, he, I want you to know that his heart changed. And we are still fighting about that word. We are still fighting about race in this country. And um, it's, it's just not easy to talk about. Uh, Faulkner is also in uh, Barn Burning, uh, is also a little bit hard on women. You'll see that the sisters of Sartorus are described as hulking in their Sunday school dresses. Okay, they're enormous. Later he calls them bovine, which is cow-like. That's not very nice. And maybe this is something like a writer I shouldn't even be offering you. Wait, there's more, and there's some good stuff in Faulkner, too. Um, what I like about this story of barn burning, trying to, not, not looking past, not justifying it, not glossing over, I'm just, I, I, I want to have a, 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 a look at the story that's a little bit more forgiving and maybe a little bit more affectionate, because he was a hell of a writer. And I, I like it for among many reasons, because... He, he liked to write about salt-of-the-earth people. He loved them. He loved the farmers uh, that, um, that grew up around him. He was happier talking to the farmer next door over a fence than he was um, going to the White House to have dinner with John F. Kennedy. He turned that invitation down because uh, he had an ego, too. He told his friends, I'm not going to drive 100 miles for a meal. And, and so he did. He liked, he liked salt-of-the-earth people, and you're going to see that here. These are simple people. There's only one person in all of Faulkner that goes to college, Quentin Compson, and that story is a, is a rough one. So you, you need to understand that. A couple of other things you need to understand that when you see italics in William Faulkner, he is enlisting a brand new literary technique in the 20th century that was pretty much invented by an Irishman named James Joyce. It's not that complicated. When you see him lock italics, you're going into someone's consciousness. He's trying to reveal what is up there, right? So you're not going to see complete sentences or complete paragraphs. It just becomes a mess because what up here is, what's up here is a mess. And I think he's pretty effective at it, too. I think he's pretty darn good at it. Hemingway attempts it, like, once 
in a farewell to arms, but um, it, it wasn't a, a, a strong effort. Faulkner uses it all the time. So just keep that in mind. When you see italics, you're going into someone's consciousness and watching it as a kind of stream. That's why we call it that. The big deal, um, and the number one thing that I want to try, help you understand today, uh, is, is, is the Faulkner sentence, okay? Now basically we have two types of sentences in English. You could say that in many ways, right? Like we have coordinate st structures and subordinate. Everybody can write a coordinate sentence at CLC, but not very many college students or high school students can control subordination. I don't even feel like talking about that. I'm much more excited talking about the difference between periodic sentences and cumulative or accumulative. A periodic sentence runs two or three clusters and then there's a period. The meaning stops and the writer resumes what they're up to. A cumulative sentence is completely different. A cumulative sentence has multiple clusters strung together. And I want to uh, it, 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 achieving something different. Not better, but something different than, than you would see with a periodic sentence. So let's just take a look uh, in closing today at one of these sentences from William Faulkner. This comes from uh, the story, The Bear, which is in uh, Go Down Moses. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm also going to read it to you. Check this out. This is genius. The dogs were there first. Ten of them huddled back under the kitchen, himself and Sam squatting to peer back into the obscurity where they crouched. Quiet, the eyes rolling and luminous, vanishing in no sound, only that effluvium which the boy could not place yet, of something more than dog, stronger than dog, and not just animal, just beast even. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, that's a run-on sentence. No, it's a, it's a masterpiece. And I don't do this very often because I don't want to wreck literature. You can wreck a poem easy. Billy Collins says we can just high school teachers just want to tie a poem to a chair and beat it with a rubber hose until it reveals every meaning. I don't want to wreck poetry like that ever, and I don't want to wreck sentences, so I only do this like once, right, in a semester. But look at this sentence um, broken down, looking under the hood of it a little bit, to speak, so to speak. This sentence has not one, not two, but eleven clusters. And it, the, the basic takeaway here, the nugget is. If you can control free-flowing modifiers that are telling us what's going on with the noun cluster, free-flowing modifiers that tell us what, where, why, when, the sentence can go on and on and on. And quite unlike us, never die. And um, this, you just got to kind of open your heart to it, tune your head up to it, so to speak, the way I would have to uh, tune my ear up to, um, you know, understand rapper um, hip-hop music, which I don't really listen to. I, I would have to, I would have to, it would take some practice. It would take a tuning up. That's all that's necessary here um, with Faulkner. And why, why would I put a sentence like this before you in a, uh, a, 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 in a comp class, so to speak? Well, because young writers, I've, I've been watching this for going on four decades, that young 18-year-old that figures out that they can pile meaning onto meaning, right? What happens is their clusters can get so long that their endings do forget their beginnings, as Shakespeare would have it. The trick, remember this, will you? The trick of good writing is to keep the clusters short and balanced. And that is not easy, boys and girls. That is not, it isn't. It's hard. Um, but it, it's, it's worth thinking about. And I'm not saying super long sentences are, are exactly my desire. Um, and I, you know, they got to breathe in and out. You got to vary the length of your sentences in the same way you got to vary your sentence openers. And um, holy crap, could Faulkner write? That's all I got for you today. I got to work on my lasagna you now. I love you guys. You got another vid coming, but I got to get through my poetry reading tomorrow. And when I get back here, my friend Mark will take him to the airport, like I told you, because he's vaxxed and masked and stuff, unlike me. And uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I'll get to spend some uh, the evening with Kevin Young. Um, and uh, I'll see you soon.